मंच पर जिन अतिथि को मैं बुलाने जा रही हूँ वो एक कवि भी हैं, समीक्षक हैं, फिल्म इतिहासकार हैं और सिनेकार निदेशक और सानिध्य सह संस्थापक जी हाँ वो और कोई नहीं उनका नाम है ललित मोहन जोशी उनका नाटक जॉर्ज कृष्णा मैनन नेहरू सेंटर लंदन में मंचित हो चुका है तथा आज वो एक वृत्त चित्र का प्रस्तुतिकरण कर रहे हैं तो मैं साधन आमंत्रित करती हूँ ललित मोहन जी जोशी आपका हार्दिक अभिनंदन है सर नमस्कार मेरा नाम ललित मोहन जोशी है ये जो डॉक्यूमेंट्री आप देखने जा रहे हैं इसका शीर्षक है ईस्ट मीट्स वेस्ट इंडो ब्रिटिश सिनेमेटिक एनकाउंटर्स यानी पूर्व और पश्चिम का मिलन और दोनों के सिनेमा में सहयोग या समागम इस फिल्म का विचार मुझे इस तरह से आया कि एक हमने रिसर्च प्रोजेक्ट किया था निरंजन पाल पे और निरंजन पाल ऐसी शख्सियत हैं जो भारतीय सिनेमा में एक तरह से अग्रणी भूमिका जिन्होंने निभाई पर भारत में बहुत कम लोग उनको जानते थे निरंजन पाल 1908 में ब्रिटेन आए और यहां आकर उन्होंने थिएटर में काम किया सिनेमा में स्ट्रगल किया उसके बाद वो बहुत बड़े सिनेकार बने उन्होंने लाइट ऑफ एशिया जिसका नाम प्रेम सन्यास भी है थ्रो ऑफ डाइज और एक और फिल्म उन्होंने बनाई शिराज जो कि अंतर्राष्ट्रीय स्तर पर भारत की महत्वपूर्ण फिल्में थी साइलेंट डेरा में यानी कि मूक युग में और उसके बाद 1930 में निरंजन पाल भारत लौट आए और हमने उस पर एक जीवनी बनाई जो कि उनकी लिखी हुई थी पर हमने उसको पुस्तक का रूप दिया उसमें और भी चीजें डाली वो किताब आज बहुत मशहूर है उसके बाद जो हमने प्रोजेक्ट किया वो ये कि उन्नीस और उन्नीस के बीच में भारत और ब्रिटेन में सिनेमा के क्षेत्र में क्या सहयोग हुआ उस पर यह डॉक्यूमेंट्री है जो आप अभी देखेंगे मैं आपसे इसके बारे में ज्यादा तो नहीं कहना चाहता पर इतना कहना चाहता हूं कि 1930 के दशक के बाद जबकि बोलती फिल्मों का युग आ गया था दो ऐसे सितारे जो कि पश्चिम के सिनेमा में चमके वो थे साबू और मल ओब्रॉन साबू एक महावत के बेटे थे दक्षिण भारत में जो कि जिनकी की खोज हुई डॉक्यूमेंट्री फिल्म के दौरान और उनको इंग्लैंड लाया गया लंदन लाया गया और अलेक्जेंडर कौडा नाम के एक सिनेकार ने उनको सितारा बनाया एलिफेंट बॉय उनकी पहली फिल्म थी इसी तरह से मल ओब्रॉन एंग्लो इंडियन थी जो कि संघर्ष करने के लिए भारत से लंदन आई और जूझते जूझते एक बार अलेक्जेंडर कौडा की निगाह उन पर पड़ी और धीरे धीरे वो बहुत बड़ी अभिनेत्री बनी और हॉलीवुड में भी चमकी इस तरह से जो 30 और इक्यावन का दशक है उसमें बहुत सारे भारत के जो कर्मी थे जो लेखक थे जो सिनेकार थे वो यहां आए उन्होंने यहां काम किया दीवान शरण में एक थे जिन्होंने कर्मा फिल्म की कहानी लिखी और कर्मा फिल्म वो थी जो हिमांशु राय का प्रोजेक्ट था जिसमें चार मिनट का चुंबन दिखाया गया था जो कि उस जमाने में जबकि सेंसरशिप थी इस तरह से ये जो डॉक्यूमेंट्री है इसमें वो सारी आ, सामग्री है जिसको देख करके आपको लगेगा कि भारत में सिनेमा और ब्रिटेन में भारत और ब्रिटेन में सिनेमा पर जो सहयोग था वो इतना पुराना है न कि वो रचन एटरबरो की गांधी से प्रारंभ होता है या स्लम डॉग मिलेनेर से प्रारंभ होता है या शेखर कपूर के एलिजाबेथ से प्रारंभ होता है बल्कि पिछली शताब्दी के बीसवीं शताब्दी के पूर्वार्ध से ही प्रारंभ होता है निरंजन पाल के युग से और उत्तरार्ध में आकर वो क्या रूप लेता है वो सारी बातें आप इस डॉक्यूमेंट्री में देखेंगे मुझे उम्मीद है आपको ये डॉक्यूमेंट्री अच्छी लगेगी आप इसे देखें और इसका आनंद लें धन्यवाद Today, Indo-British film collaborations like Danny Boyle's *Slumdog Millionaire* and Richard Attenborough's *Gandhi* are common. Are they products of globalization, or do they go further into the past? In what areas did Indo-British film encounters between 1930 and 1951 occur?
In the 1930s, British cinema threw up two big stars from India, Merle Oberon and Sabu. Both had become international celebrities by the 1940s. Merle Oberon uh, was very, very beautiful. Uh, the first thing people noticed about her was her stunning good looks. It comes across from various biographies that she was very keen to enter the film world. And Calcutta was a great place at that time because a number of Englishmen used to be there and she used to frequent fashionable places like Furpo's in Calcutta, which was a very fashionable joint and she met a number of people and that's where she met people from the film world and got some contacts to come over to Europe. Merle Oberon came to London. Uh, she worked at the Café de Paris. She very much wanted to, to get into the movie business. She was starstruck herself. She loved movies and she wanted to become a movie star. The filmmaker who introduced Merle Oberon in Sabu was Alexander Korda. Alexander Korda was unique in British cinema. He was the only equivalent in Britain of the great Hollywood moguls like the Warner Brothers and Louis B. Mayer. Um, like them, he was an immigrant. He was, in fact, a Hungarian Jew. He had established himself as a very capable film director in Hungary, Germany, France and Hollywood, where he'd made 11 films. He came to Britain in the early 30s um, and set himself up as a grand producer. He became a naturalised British subject in 1936 and he set up London Films with its characteristic logo of Big Ben. And he set out to make quality films with international appeal. Well, Alexander Corder was a very prominent British film producer of the 1930s and 1940s. And he was very committed to two things. First of all, to the idea of British cinema as an international cinema. He wanted to make big films with expensive production values that would compete with the best that Hollywood could offer in the world market. And secondly, he was very concerned with the projection of Britain, his adopted country. Indo-British film partnerships in Britain actually began a decade before Corda, when writer-director Niranjan Pal and actor-producer Himansu Rai made three silent films, Light of Asia, Shiraz, and A Throw of Dice. In 1931, British filmmaker Sinclair Hill directed one of UK's earliest talking suspense thrillers, A Gentleman of Paris. Its actors, Sybil Thorndike, Arthur Wontner and Vanda Greville were also British. But its story writer was Niranjan Pal, an Indian, whose name appears in big bold letters at the start of the film. The first Indo-British talkie was Shikari. It was made in 1932. It was an Indo-British collaboration because it had its main actors were Indian. Uh, P. Jairaj was uh, the hero of the film and Sita Devi who had acted in silent films in the 1920s in the films of Himan Shurai and uh, Niranjan Pal was the heroine of the film. So it was shot in India mainly in outside and it was completed in the UK. It was edited by Thoral Dickinson, and it's, but its main actors and the story was Indian. Thoral Dickinson, who edited Shikari, also edited Karma. Hello, Quirrell. No, don't run away. Now, stop there and tell me if you have seen a princess walking by. In the 1930s, uh, the film that really hit the headlines was Karma. Uh, starring Himanchu Rai and his wife Devi Karani. It was the first Indo-British talking film and it was also a bilingual film because it was made in English as well as in Hindi or Hindustani. Karma's story writer was Diwan Sharar, an Indian from the Punjab. It was a romantic tale of an Indian prince and princess. A real princess, Sudharani of Bardwan, acted in it. The holy man's role was played by British theatre and film actor of Burmese Jewish origin, Abraham Sofier. 
It was shot in India and completed in Cricklewood's Stoll Studios. Karma was the first Indo-British talkie to be launched in London. It was premiered in London's Marble Arch Pavilion and watched by a host of British and Indian VIPs. Karma created a stir wherever it was screened. It was widely covered by the British press. In Birmingham, its leading lady Devika Rani was received by the Lord Mayor and won wide acclaim. Her beauty, elegance and English diction became talking points. Karma's music and the songs sung by Devika herself were composed by Roy Douglas of the London Symphony Orchestra. In 2008, Douglas, who was then nearing 100, wrote a letter to SACF about his karma experience. In the northeastern part of India is the province of Bengal. Its area is 76,843 square miles. Its population, 60 million. Indo-British encounters also happened in documentary filmmaking. During the war, India's Ezra Mir made British war propaganda and information films on India. In the 1940s, Bimal Roy of Calcutta's New Theatres directed Teens for India for Burma Shell, a British and Dutch company, and was cameraman for Bengal famine. The most outstanding documentary filmmaker was Hans Nieter O'Leary. And I, I found them fascinating. Uh, they are very beautiful films. They show this exotic, extraordinary place. Shot in India, Nieter's Temples of India has a dance sequence depicting Lord Shiva as Nataraj, the cosmic dancer. It was specially choreographed with authentic Indian music by the Menka Indian Ballet, a company founded by Lady Menka, daughter of an English mother and an Indian father. The dancer was Pandit Ram Narayan. Nita's documentaries are valuable. They have captured the India of the 1930s for posterity, but they have also been criticized. They, I would have thought in India, you would have got as angry about those films as, as, as you would have done about the drum, because they're portraying India as a place that has this fabulous past, but it's all in the past. And it's not possible for India to um, go forward without Britain's help. And that's very much the view one seemed to get out of these films. So that's the problem with those, those films, the fact that they give a view of an India that's somehow tied to past glory. These documentaries aimed to educate the West about the East. But the future of large-scale film collaboration lay in feature filmmaking. Here, Alexander Korda was the king. Korda had a flair for spotting talent. His choice of Merle Oberon proves this. Merle had arrived in London in 1929 with nothing except her youth and beauty. She was neither British nor white, but a foreigner and an Anglo-Indian derisively called Chichi by the British. Born in 1911 in Bombay St. George's Hospital, she was the product of a mixed marriage between an Englishman and a woman of mixed Sri Lankan and European blood. Christened as Estelle Merle O'Brien Thompson in St. Emmanuel's Church, she spent her early years in Kethwari, an undistinguished suburb of Bombay. It was Koda's careful planning that converted Merle from an unknown girl doing uncredited bits into a famous actress. Koda's ambitious period film, The Private Life of Henry VIII, changed her life. 
The role he gave her was that of Anne Boleyn. It was a landmark film for Merle, was a huge success in America, and also placed Britain on the world's film map. This was not a small movie. This was a film which had a Hollywood-scale budget. It was a film that Corder was determined should uh, really make his fortune. And Merle Oberon had a very small role in this uh, uh, film, but it was uh, a fantastic role if you wanted to be showcased. She was playing Anne Boleyn. Very difficult to imagine a more dramatic role than that. The queen, the beautiful queen, who's going to have her head chopped off. And Merle Oberon makes absolutely the most of that part. In many films, Merle was projected as an actress with exotic oriental looks. The 1935 film Dark Angel transformed her into a typical English rose. Coda, in 1937, cast her in an ambitious period film, I, Claudius. It was a lavish production with a huge cast and fabulous sets designed by Vincent Corda. Unfortunately, this epic was not to be. I was Alex's only star at the time, under, under contract to him, I mean. I had done um, not very much. I was very young, but, I had, but they'd all been very successful. Henry VIII, The Scarlet Pimpernel, Don Juan, and then uh, The Dark Angel with Sam Goldwyn in America, which was a very big success. And um, I think Alex wanted to really make me the big star. And um, so he bought I, Claudius, and cast Charles Lawton as Claudius, and Messalina for me. And then Alex decided that he would get von Sternberg to direct me, because von Sternberg was a woman's director. He just wanted to give me everything he could to, to make me shine. I had worked with Charles, I uh, knew and respected Charles as a great actor. And uh, suddenly something very, very odd happened to him. He would come on the set every day and um, get made up and get dressed and, um, and then say he couldn't, couldn't find his character. We were delivered by a most unfortunate thing to me, an accident. I had a motor car accident. And um, so they canceled the picture. Despite rumors that her face had been permanently scarred, Merle recovered. In 1938, she appeared in Over the Moon and in a romantic comedy, The Divorce of Lady X. Merle's career kept climbing. In 1939, Coda married her. Soon, she rose to a new height when she played Kathy against Laurence Olivier in William Wyler's Wuthering Heights. Wuthering Heights is a great example of, of Merle Oberon as a very um, accomplished uh, movie star. You understand why she was a movie star when you see Wuthering Heights. I, I think it's a wonderful film because it brings together so many things. It brings together great star personalities, Merle Oberon playing uh, opposite Laurence Olivier, but it also brings together wonderful filmmaking talent. All along, Merle had hidden her Indian roots. Why? The subject of miscegenation, that is interracial sex and interracial marriage, was absolutely forbidden in films. You could not depict this. And it reflected a widely held social prejudice. So the idea that one of Britain's leading producers would be married to somebody who wasn't fully white would have been social, social death, I would have thought. People love um, the idea of hidden secrets. And that's very much the attitude that's taken to this idea of Merle Oberon hiding her origins, her, her mixed race origins. And I can't help feel that, in a way, it's a little bit of a storm in, 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 in a teacup when you're aware of the nature of society in um, Britain in the 1930s. Not just Britain, but in, in America too. These are societies where races do not mix. These are societies where, um, if you want to have a successful Western 
um, movie career, you have to play, um, you can't afford to admit that you have mixed race origins. Uh, it's a time where we even have laws, you know, if you look at the Hollywood Code, there's one of the rules in the Hollywood Code is that miscegenation, I think is the word they use, should not be portrayed on, on, on the screen. Uh, mixed race romances are frowned upon. They're never shown on the screen. So, so given that reality, what uh, was Merle Oberon to do? Given that reality, if she wanted to have any kind of career at all as a big movie star, then she had to, to, uh, she had to hide that, that background. Another actor picked, nurtured and exhibited by Koda was Sabu. He was found in Mysore where Koda had sent Robert Flaherty and Osman Bordale to film Indian Elephants. It was to be based on Rudyard Kipling's To My of the Elephants. Maharaja of Mysore and his Prime Minister gave them lavish hospitality. They offered them elephants and other facilities, including an unused royal palace. Sabu stands alone. He was the only Indian star in the Western world, and he was Britain's only child star. Uh, Robert Flaherty, who was one of the leading documentarists of the age, was sent by Corder to India with more or less a free hand to make a film about the role of the elephant in Indian economy and culture. And he was going to be uh, doing it around the story of a relationship of a boy and an elephant. And they needed a boy when they got there. And I think Flaherty actually found a boy whom he thought would do, but the, the cameraman, Osmond Borrowdale, found England after Corda shipped Sabu to England. It was premiered in London's Leicester Square Theatre in April 1937. It was a grand success, and Sabu won accolades from all over the world. Flaherty was trying to capture um, India. I think India was probably, for him, much more interesting than the, the, the Kipling story. That was what he wanted to capture, the, the, the um, atmosphere of, of this extraordinary place. ...him to make Empire Films. What was the idea behind Empire Films? Corder, as a filmmaker, was looking to find um, epic stories. And in Britain, obviously an epic story was the empire. So making films about the empire was something that made sense in um, terms of spectacle. I think the cinema of empire is, is, is a genre which is about the projection of, and, and in the early period, sort of the promotion of ideologies of imperialism. It tends to be films about the British Empire, although it's not only British films. The Empire films were a personal project of Corder's. Corder was a, a, an Anglophile. Um, he believed in the British establishment, of which he became a part when he was knighted in 1942. He believed, above all, in the British Empire. It appealed to him uh, because he saw it as a vehicle for the expression of British character. But really, most of all, he saw it, the British Empire, as a force for stability, peace and order in a very disturbed world. And what you have to think about is what's happening in the 1930s in the world. America has retreated into isolationism. And he saw the British Empire as not a force for conquest or expansion or exploitation, but as a force for stability in the world, when, because it was a democracy. Um, when the rest of, of the world is, is, is either opting out or being conquered or, or being dictated to. Korda's The Drum was a classic empire film set in India. It gave him opportunities to showcase his new find, Sabu. Well, The Drum um, was the, the second of Korda's um, Indian-themed films. It was a northwest frontier adventure epic and we see a number of those films in the late 1930s including from Hollywood uh, Gunga Din I think is the perhaps the best point of comparison also a controversial film in India from a British perspective the film is certainly promoting the idea of British rule and colonialism it's promoting colonialism as a positive ideological project was specifically
specifically designed for him by Corda, written for him by A.E.W. Mason, the well-known novelist. Once again, a boy is at the center of it, but this time it's a, a friendship between an Indian boy and an English boy, which he wanted to be a part of the film. There's no doubt at all that it's a celebration of the British Raj, because it involves a British hero um, helping to suppress a, a native uprising, but a native uprising not in favor of Indian independence, but in favor of the tyranny of the native leader who is leading it, Ghul Khan, who proposes to, to take over the state of Tokot and then ravage down into India. I think the opposition is quite understandable because although the film, The Drum, was very successful in the UK and the USA, it was severely opposed in various parts of India and there were strong protests against it because it was construed to be a film that was uh, antithetical to ideas of nationalism which were picking up strength in India at that time and it was sort of uh, propagating pro-imperial ideas through the cinema of Alexander Corder. So it was perfectly justified. Uh, if I was an Indian, I think I'd be very angry about the drama. I think um, I, I would find it deeply patronizing. Um, I would say, you know, I'd like to have my country, you know, let me have my country, as a lot of people in India were saying. So, you know, from that perspective, it, it, it's an outrageous film in some way. But, you know, we're still in the 1930s where um, the empire has another, I don't know, decade and a half to unravel. Um, and I think more things are going on. But making empire films was not feasible after World War II began. Koda turned to making grand films on exotic oriental themes where he cast Sabu in stellar roles. The most outstanding is The Thief of Baghdad. Sabu played the lovable thief Abu in this Arabian Nights Technicolor extravaganza. With us on a ship of adventure to meet the thief of Baghdad. When I talk about Sabu, I'm a 14-year-old back in a, a cinema seeing the thief of Baghdad. He just, he just fall in love with that character. On camera, he was just, just this magical personality. You know, you would go anywhere with him. Um, he just had a sense of life and spirit and possibility, and um, the, the wonder of being alive. That's what, what comes out of the, the, a movie like Thief of Baghdad. The Thief of Baghdad is a classic, not just for Sabu's performance. Its captivating special effects, created through the new blue screen technique, wrought magic. They have continued to inspire filmmakers to this day. Koda's empire and oriental films also provided opportunities to poor Indian seamen known as Lushkars. The Lushkars were used in crowd scenes of films like The Thief of Baghdad. In 1938, the numbers of Lushkars working in films rose so high that one of them set up a union to protect their interests. Other filmmakers also needed Indians and orientals. In the 1920s, when Britain's Rex Ingram made his oriental romance, The Garden of Allah, he gave an oriental role to Sheikh Iftikhar Rasul. Rasul was a native of Multan. He came to London in 1924 and joined London's Middle Temple to study law. He lived in Woking, not far from Woking's historic Shah Jahan Mosque. In 1929, Madrid's ABC magazine wrote that Rasul played an oriental role in Sherzad. He was also called the Rudolf Valentino of the East. Rasul wrote in a 1931 issue of Filmland that he was directing La La Ruch, a film inspired by Thomas Moore's English poem of the same name. The same year, London's Who's Who in Filmland credited him for inventing and introducing two new forms of ballroom dance. Sadly, none of his works are traceable now. Besides acting, Indians like Diwan Sharar found work in other areas of filmmaking in UK. A graduate of Government College Lahore, Sharar had come to London in 1933. 
From his residence in London's posh Bloomsbury area, he established himself as a novelist and writer of English radio plays for the BBC. In 1937, his knowledge of Indian cinema was recognised when he was invited by London's prestigious East India Association to give a lecture on Indian cinema, its scope and possibilities at Caxton Hall. He became directly linked to British cinema when he was appointed Eastern advisor to veteran British actor George Arliss. He advised Arliss in two English films, East Meets West and His Lordship. East Meets West and His Lordship are very, very interesting films. They are films that starred George Arliss, who was one of the greatest but now most forgotten stars um, in, in, in cinema, both in Britain and in Hollywood. Um, he won an Oscar in 1929 for playing Disraeli. Uh, and the film which really captured the public imagination was a film called The Green Goddess. The Green Goddess had been a huge stage success. He filmed it silent in 1923 and a talkie in 1930. And in this, he plays the Raja of Rukh, who's the ruler of a Hindu state. In both films, Arliss was playing oriental characters for which he was famous. Scherer's job was to be at Arliss's elbow, making sure he did not commit any cultural faux pas. In the post-war years of decolonization and the retreat of empire, British filmmakers were pushed away from pro-imperial writers like Kipling towards authors with a different view of imperialism, the British Raj, and India. A film that typified this change was Black Narcissus, based on a story by Ruma Gooden. Directed by Michael Powell and Emmerich Pressburger, Black Narcissus was set in the Himalayas of northern India. Sabu played a young general with British actors Flora Robson, Deborah Kerr, and Jean Simmons. Though not pro-imperial, it projected an unreal picture of India. It wasn't a real India. It was building on the kind of empire cliches of um, Eastern exoticism and creating a world um, around that. Yet having said that, of course, the world that's created is just quite fabulous um, and extraordinarily achieved. And within the story, it's just, just terrifically done. Soon after the retreat of Empire came a film with an absolutely different ring. This was The River by French director Jean Renoir. Shot in Bengal, The River was again based on a story by Rumer Gooden. She was also involved in writing the screenplay and shooting the film. It was an international production. Though produced by an American florist, it had a high percentage of Indian investment. Indians also had valuable creative input in the film. Satyajit Ray helped and advised Ranwa on appropriate locations. Some of his friends like Hari Sadhan Das Gupta, Subrata Mitra, and Bansi Chandra Gupta joined Renoir's film team and were also credited for their work. Apart from American and English actors, the cast had a large number of Indians. I saw The River a long time ago, and I remember when I saw it just, just being hugely affected by it. And the reason why was because I felt that I was being given a non-judgmental, true vision of India. Um, I was in the hands of a director who was trying to discover a country rather than um, project um, an image which wasn't true. Um, and I think that was the great, you know, that's why Jean Renoir is one of the world's great directors, I think, because he was non-judgmental. He had a truly inquiring spirit. Well, Jean Renoir's film The River um, from 1951 is an incredibly important film and it marks a change in the way in which Western filmmakers, important to remember that Renoir was French, uh, represented um, India. Um, it's significant I think for two reasons. Um, first of all it's not a, a, a gung-ho imperial adventure epic, it's a very down-to-earth film about people and about communities. It's a film that has no obvious plot in, in a conventional sense. Um, and this was a characteristic that we see in European cinema, particularly in the Italian neorealist movement in the late 1940s. And Renoir was perhaps influenced to a degree by that movement, focusing on real people in real social situations and, and filming on location, which I think is quite crucial. 
I think Renoir's river is, is a masterpiece. Um, it, it is both beautiful to look at, uh, and it is also something which tries to interweave the experiences of, of three young girls growing up, experiencing first love, experiencing loss and bereavement and so forth, uh, with the rhythms and patterns of nature. The river throw, flows through it throughout. They created an extraordinary facsimile of India. Satyajit Ray met and observed Renoir during the making of the river. Though he was not bowled over by the film, he regarded Renoir as his mentor. By 1955, Ray made his film debut with Pather Panchali. Like Koda's Henry VIII, this acclaimed film placed India on the world's film map. These films are part of our shared cultural heritage and therefore they're important for people to, to see. Um, it's also important for students today to understand how filmmakers have tried to represent different cultures and how when we look at films over a period of time the nature of those representations has changed. So to go to, back to something that's historical and, and, and that represents a very different set of values and attitudes, even if those are the prevailing values and attitudes of the time, can be quite challenging for them. But that's the value of cinema, I think. It's, it's a fascinating insight into social mores and behaviour, um, understanding how people think about themselves, but also understanding how people were being perhaps even instructed to think about societies and cultures that were different from their own. कार्यक्रम समापन की ओर है और समापन से पहले मैं पद्मेश सर का कोटिश आभार व्यक्त करती हूँ कि उन्होंने अपने वट वृक्ष जैसी शीतल छाया में मुझे इस कार्यक्रम के संचालन का सौभाग्य प्रदान किया तथा समय समय पर अपना मार्गदर्शन करते रहे तो बहुत बहुत धन्यवाद सर आपका अब हम आज के सत्र के समापन पर अपने विचार प्रस्तुत करने के लिए तरुण जी को आमंत्रित कर रहे हैं तरुण कुमार जी जो भारतीय उच्च आयोग लंदन में अताशे हैं, जो भारत सरकार में हिंदी अनुवादक रहे हैं उन्होंने बहुत सी पुस्तकों का अंग्रेजी से हिंदी में अनुवाद किया है राजेंद्र अरुण जी की पुस्तक भरत गुणगाता का भारत ए सेल्फलेस सोल अंग्रेजी में अनुवाद किया है कई प्रतिष्ठित पत्र पत्रिकाओं में इनके आलेख प्रकाशित होते हैं और अभी काव्य गोष्ठियों में ये काव्य पाठ भी करने लगे हैं और बहुत अच्छी कविताएं पढ़ते हैं तो मैं साधन आमंत्रित करती हूँ तरुण कुमार जी को तरुण जी आपका हार्दिक अभिनंदन है नमस्कार सर्वप्रथम मैं आभार प्रकट करना चाहूँगा डॉक्टर पद्मेश गुप्त जी का और वातायन का जिन्होंने मुझे विश्व रंग के इस विशाल और भव्य मंच पर आयोजित वेबिनार में शामिल होने का अवसर प्रदान किया और इस महोत्सव के दूसरे दिन के सत्र का समापन वक्तव्य देने का दायित्व सौंपा आज का यह सत्र कई मायनों में महत्वपूर्ण है रोचक होने के साथ साथ यह सूचनाप्रद और ज्ञानवर्धक भी था मुझे पूरा विश्वास है आज प्रस्तुत रचनाओं और उनकी विवेचना से उनके मूल्यांकन की नई राह खुलेगी सभी वक्ताओं ने अपनी बात अपने अपने अंदाज में पूरी ईमानदारी के साथ कही सबसे पहले बात करते हैं अरुणा अजित सरिया जी की जिन्होंने ऋचा जैन जिंदल के प्रथम काव्य संग्रह जीवन वृत्त व्यास ऋचाएं की बहुत ही सुरुचिपूर्ण और सुंदर विवेचना की अरुणा जी एक निपुण समीक्षक हैं 
और उनकी समीक्षा किसी भी रचना के मूल्यांकन की एक नई कसौटी बन जाती है उनके समीक्षात्मक निकष पर जो भी साहित्य कृति खरी उतरती है उसके श्रेष्ठ होने पर किसी प्रकार के संदेह की गुंजाइश नहीं रहती है अरुणा जी अपनी बात बेवाकी के साथ रखे जाने के लिए जानी जाती हैं और आज भी उन्होंने ऋचा जैन के काव्य संग्रह पर अपनी बात पूरी बेवाकी के साथ रखी और इसका सटीक विश्लेषण किया क्योंकि इस संग्रह को मैंने स्वयं भी कई बार पढ़ा है और इसलिए इसमें संग्रहित रचनाओं की अरुणा जी द्वारा की गई विवेचना से मैं पूरी तरह सहमत हूँ कई जगह तो मैं खुद को जांच रहा था कि अरुणा जी जे जी ने जो लिखा है क्या वैसी बात मैंने अपनी समीक्षा में कही थी या लिखी थी और मैंने पाया कि अरुणा जी ने मुझसे ज़्यादा बेहतर इसकी समीक्षा की ब्रिटेन में नई पीढ़ी के रचनाकारों में ऋचा जैन अपना एक महत्वपूर्ण स्थान रखती हैं और सचमुच उनकी कविताएं ब्रिटेन में हिंदी कविता के नवसृजन की उम्मीद जगाती हैं अपने इस संग्रह में उन्होंने जीवन के विविध रंगों को उकेरने का प्रयास किया है और इस प्रयास में वह सफल भी रही हैं इस संकलन की कविताओं में विषय वस्तु मनोस्थिति और चिंतन की विविधता है कुछ कविताएं पारिवारिक संबंधों का उत्सव मनाती हैं तो कुछ उदात्त मानव मूल्यों की स्थापना भी करती हैं जैसे उनकी उबंटू कविता जिसमें एक अफ्रीकी प्रतीक के माध्यम से जीवन में साहचर्य के महत्व को उन्होंने रेखांकित किया है अरुणा जी ने संग्रह की कई रचनाओं की बहुत सुंदर व्याख्या की और उनका पाठ भी किया आज के इस सत्र में पूनम देव जी ने ब्रिटेन की जानी मानी लेखिका और कवयत्री और उपन्यासकार शैल जी अग्रवाल की कहानी जीजी का आंशिक रूप में बहुत सुंदर पाठ किया शैल जी की कहानियां मानव मन की सूक्ष्म अभिव्यंजना प्रस्तुत करती हैं जीजी की कहानी भी पाठकों के मन पर गहरा असर छोड़ती है उनकी दो कहानियां 48 घंटे और बीच पढ़ने का मुझे सौभाग्य मिला है और उनके लेखन से मैं कुछ हद तक परिचित हूँ उनकी कहानियां पाठकों को अंत तक बांधे रखती है प्रस्तुत कहानी जी जी भी काफ़ी मार्मिक और हृदय स्पर्शी है हिना बख्शी जी ने भी उषा वर्मा की कहानी कॉस्ट इफेक्टिव का बहुत रोचक ढंग से पाठ किया उषा जी ने पारिवारिक और सामाजिक संबंधों पर अनेक कहानियाँ लिखी हैं जो बहुत प्रभावकारी हैं आज प्रस्तुत कहानी भी का बहुत हृदय स्पर्शी रही कादम्बरी जी ब्रिटेन की एक सशक्त रचनाकार हैं उन्होंने साहित्य के अनेक विधाओं में अपनी लेखनी चलाई है परंतु वे मुख्यतः कहानीकार हैं और अपने नए उपन्यास निष्प्राण गवाह के साथ उन्होंने साहित्य लेखन की अपनी जमीन का विस्तार किया है निष्प्राण गवाह देखा जाए तो एक मर्डर मिस्ट्री है बहुत कम महिला लेखिकाओं ने इस विधा में अपना हाथ आजमाया है लेकिन कादम्बरी जी का यह उपन्यास एक साहसिक कदम है साहसिक इस अर्थ में कि मर्डर मिस्ट्री लिखने के लिए जासूसी दिमाग की जरूरत होती है सारे सूत्रों को जोड़ना और अगर एक भी सिरा हाथ से छूट जाए तो रहस्य के बाहर आ जाने का खतरा रहता है रहस्य अंत तक बरकरार रखना और पाठकों की रुचि इसमें बनाए रखना एक चुनौती होती है कादम्बरी जी इस कार्य में सफल हुई हैं शन्नो जी अग्रवाल ने इसकी बहुत ही सुंदर समीक्षात्मक प्रस्तुति की है उपन्यास एक मर्डर मिस्ट्री होने के साथ साथ ब्रिटेन के जीवन और सामाजिक समस्याओं का चित्रण भी प्रस्तुत करता है शन्नो जी ने बहुत ही सीमित शब्दों में उपन्यास का कथासार और इसकी खूबियों और खामियों का बड़ा ही सुंदर चित्रण प्रस्तुत किया है रश्मि खुराना जी द्वारा अरुणा सबरवाल की कहानी वे चार पराठे का भी बहुत ही सुंदर पाठ किया गया यह कहानी मन को छू गई अरुणा जी सामाजिक और पारिवारिक रिश्तों को अपनी कहानियों में बुनने में पारंगत हैं उनकी पारिवारिक रिश्तों पर बुनी हुई कहानियां मार्मिक और हृदय स्पर्शी होती हैं ऐसी ही कहानी वे चार पराठे हैं जो मानवीय रिश्तों को एक नई ऊंचाई देती है 
यह कहानी एक साथ समाज में करुणा प्रेम विश्वास जैसे मूल्यों की स्थापना भी करती है महेंद्र देवेसर की कहानी इबू भी मानवीय रिश्तों पर आधारित है जो इंडोनेशिया में 2004 में आए सुनामी तूफान के पृष्ठभूमि में लिखी गई है यह कृष्णकांत टंडन जी ने इसका बहुत ही ओझपूर्ण और रोचक ढंग से पाठ किया कहानी में करुणा प्रेम वात्सल्य जैसी मानवीय संवेदनाओं का बहुत सुंदर चित्रण किया गया है इंडोनेशियाई भाषा में ईबू का अर्थ होता है माँ तूफान की विभिषका में एक तीन वर्ष का बच्चा अपनी माँ को पुकारता हुआ शेफाली के कमरे के सामने आ जाता है जिसे देखकर शेफाली के मन में मातृत्व बोध जगता है उसे वह गोद लेने और अपने साथ लंदन लाने का हर संभव प्रयास करती है लेकिन अंततः वह इसमें असफल रहती है कहानी में घटनाओं का अंकन किसी फिल्म के दृश्यांतर सा हुआ है इसलिए पाठकों की चेतना पर इसका असर लंबे समय तक रहता है सरिता सवरवाल की एक मंजी हुई रेडियो प्रेजेंटर हैं और जय वर्मा जी की कहानी सात कदम का उन्होंने अपने अंदाज में पाठ किया और कहानी को जीवंत बना दिया डायरी के माध्यम से यूके के जीवन में झांकने के उत्सुक प्रयास का प्रतिफल है शिखा वार्स ने जी की पुस्तक देसी चश्मे से लंदन डायरी कहते हैं साहित्य समाज का दर्पण होता है शिखा जी की यह डायरी लंदन के समाज का दर्पण है इसमें यूके के इतिहास भूगोल संस्कृति समाज आदि अनेक विषयों के दर्शन होते हैं मनीषा कुलश्रेष्ठ और मधु चौरसिया जी ने इसकी बहुत ही सुंदर शब्दों में समीक्षा प्रस्तुत की इस प्रकार हमने पाया कि विश्व रंग के इस महोत्सव के दूसरे दिन के सत्र में कहानियों कविताओं उपन्यास और संस्मरणात्मक डायरी आदि की विवेचनाओं और इनके आकर्षक पाठ में मानवीय संवेदनाओं के विविध रंगों का इंद्र धनुष उतरा मैं समझता हूँ इस आज प्रस्तुत विवेचनाओं से संबंधित रचनाओं की बेहतर समझ बनेगी और इन कृतियों का मूल्यवर्धन होगा ये साहित्य कृतियाँ अपने समय और समाज को अभिव्यक्त देने की दृष्टि से और हिंदी की मुख्य धारा में नई संवेदनाएं जोड़ने की दृष्टि से संपूर्ण हिंदी साहित्य की अमूल्य निधि हैं इन्हीं शब्दों के साथ आज के इस सत्र के आयोजन के लिए मैं बधाई देता हूं और अंत में इंदु बारेट जी को कार्यक्रम के सफल संचालन के लिए अनेक अनेक बधाई और शुभकामनाएं उन्होंने बहुत ही सीमित शब्दों में और संतुलित ढंग से मंच संचालन किया और एक उत्कृष्ट मंच संचालक होने का परिचय दिया धन्यवाद